Can you explain your transition into Jungle? I went to Jamaica in 1988. When I came back, I was done with sound because when I went to Jamaica and I saw how the old sound system team was running out there and the way how, just the way the living and, you know, the culture, mm -hmm. just the way how people lived, I realised that England weren't really cutting it for me again. And the sound system team had, had already peaked. You know, I'd already peaked. Okay. I the ceiling. I didn't feel like I could go nowhere in sound system further than I already got apart from turning it into an artist thing. And you have to remember at that time, you had people like Smiley Culture, Tipper, you had the whole Saxon crew, they were getting a lot, a lot of love. Then Freddie, you know, Fly had a big tune, Top Cat, he had big tunes. General Relief, he came later, he came late, late 80s, early 90s. Um, Sweet, he had big tunes. Sweet, he was a good day with flipping. Um, what was that tune? On and on. As well. On and on. As well, yeah. Yeah. So sweet, he had a big tune from like way back in the 80s. So all of these men them had tunes, but we never had none. So me, D, Man, and Flinny, we never had none. So we ain't got no catalogue. So what happened was the Acid House started to creep in. And then it kind of, I started to go around D, Man, and Flinty late, no, 1990, 1990. At that time, it was still Acid House. In 91, 92, this hardcore kind of sound came in, right? Mm -hmm. And then after that, it changed to Jungle around late 92, going into 93. So I watched the music morph in the space of three years from Acid House to Hardcore and into Jungle. But when I first left Sound System, I used to walk down the road in the areas and that, and people used to say, like, wow, the spec here, you know, DJ upon song again. And I used to say, because I mean, I make no money. I mean, no, so we can DJ a good. I mean, now I make no money, so it don't make no sense, you know? So they're like, so what are you going to do? And I've got offers on so many sound systems to go on DJ, but I was just like, no, I didn't want to do that no more, you know? I was looking for another angle, you know? And by the grace of God, this jungle thing happened, and Demon of Flinty basically drew me into it. Um, I can remember one night I was in a story, and I was there with my bent-up face, with my click suit on, and my jewellery, and my fur kangol, and my suede belly, and all of this, and people walking around in you know, tracksuits, sweat bottoms and things like that. They give me water and ask me, you got anything, mate? You got anything, mate? And I was like, well, do I look like a flipping drug dealer or something? But I did look like a drug dealer, you know? And D-Man said to me one day, yo, you have to fix up, you know? I don't want you coming down here with your bent up face because you're giving us a bad name. So fix up, you know what I mean? Otherwise, I'm not carry you back to no more dance. And that was when I kind of fixed up. I went and bought some more, you know, I went and bought some little shell bottoms and two little jacket, you know, a little puffer jacket then and started getting myself into the team. I was already 30 by then. So, you know, you're like, in terms of reggae, you know, you're you're an elder. You're yeah. sort of like a, you're an older guy now. So, you, you know, you dress a certain way and carry yourself a certain way. Yeah, That's yeah. all attached to the sound system and Jamaican culture, mm -hmm. or West Indian culture. So, you know, coming into this this whole thing and it's all people on pills and love, love dub and all of this, I wasn't used to it. I didn't understand it. But as it went along, I started to get it. This is a different way. They grew up in a different era to us, you know, because we did that whole 10 years of sound system. So when we're looking at these people, you know, the first time I went to Astoria, I saw Prodigy, man, doing Charlie Says on the stage live. You know, with the sound system crowd, and then the, the acid house or the hardcore crowd, how different, like for you, how different was it? Because I'm guessing that it's a completely different vibe then. Totally. Because, you know, sound system was, you know, in my era, it was about rubber dub reggae, rubber dub dancehall. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's very, you know, you're dancing with women in the dance, slow wine, you know, and you know, it wasn't very hype. You know, the, the only thing that used to get the people that were hype was the mic man then. Mm -hmm. They used to get the people in hype because they used to like the style or whatever, or they liked the lyrics, and, and that would get the people hype. But the music itself was rubber dub reggae, so it was a very laid back of it. It wasn't hype like that, you know. Obviously, it was the tunes would like, you know, when, it, when you're playing Sound Clash and you're playing dubs and all of that, and you play some wicked dub or whatever, Unity had a very loyal crowd, you know. Our crowd would follow us everywhere, and they were lively. They used mm -hmm. to make noise, you know, as soon as we go on the mic, you know, be annoyed and start beat on the wall and beat on the song, box them with them hand and be a nice up you know what I mean? So that's how we kind of came up in it. But when I went to a rave, totally different level. It was a totally different level of energy, atmosphere, everybody high on drugs. So faster tempo. And even though it was faster tempo 
at that at that stage there, it's, it was slow compared to now. It was slow, but it was a lot faster than reggae. It was double time, you know. We used to see Rebel, Rebel MC, yeah. Rebel Nappy. Yeah, he used to be out there doing his thing. You know, he had a big name. You know, that hip-hop era there, that kind of hip-hop sound system, and then the hip-hop artists that sort of brought it into the rave scene, you know, that's a very important era as well that gets overlooked. People like Skinny Man and Rodney P and Black Twang, all these guys, you know, Demon Boys, Million Dan, and even Russ Demo, all of these guys were there back in the day doing their thing, but they just missed the boat on the big sound systems, you know. If you ask Rodney P and all of these guys, they'll tell you, I used to listen to Specky, we used to listen to Navi and Demon and Flinty, we grew on him, on them man there, because we were the man there at that time. We had it, we had it, a monopoly on it, you know, we had it locked. Pretty much like how we got Jungle MC locked now. So, with regards to the jungle scene then, Cool FM, how important is it in the story of Jungle and how did you get onto Cool FM? Well, before you say Cool FM, you have to say Rose. Okay. You have to say Rose because Rose was the first promotion to start promoting Strictly Jungle Dances because they were the ones that promoted that sound. A lot of these promoters didn't want to play that sound because they felt threatened by it. You know, when you go to Rose, it was a blackout, man. There's big black people in there. You know what I'm saying? So was that more of, you know, when you're sort of talking about the sound, is that the, the sound which has more of a reggae influence? Yeah, exactly. You know, a guy called Gerald, or 28 Gun Bad Boy, oh, 28 Gun Bad Boy, the B, B lines, even though that was an original B line, but you'd have, you know, I don't know, man, even... We are E and they had um I remember Groove Rider played it one time one one version of um, Prophecy. Prophecy Yeah doom, yeah doom, 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 doom. I grew up on this music. So I'm thirty years of age in a Sunday Rose, Linford Studio, South London, Battersea, and they're playing music that I grew up listening to when I was fourteen, fifteen. I felt like I was a little you again. Yeah. That's what jungle did for me. Plus at that stage I was living on Broadwater Farm and, you know, it wasn't a joke, you know. Broadwater Farm was it was a dangerous place. It was a police no-go area. There was a lot of madness going on over there, you know. There was risks that was, you know, I was putting myself at risk being there and, you know, the only way out was to try and make it, doing something musically. So when the jungle came along, it kind of saved me, man, from, you know, a life that could have turned out anyway. I might not even be alive now the way it was back then. Do you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I'm in these dances and it gave me a new lease of life. And that was in Sunday Roast. And it was being in the Sunday Roasts and not being able to get on the mic. But I'd be touring with Ragga Twins as their hype man, but they wouldn't let me on the mic in the parties. And that's when um, Flinty took me to Cool FM and I joined Cool FM. And at that time, Weekend Rush was the big station in Hackney. But I tell you, within the space of about six months, even less, Cool FM just took over, man, and we were riding the wave of the burgeoning jungle scene. The music was just beginning to come true, and Cool FM was like the roast of the pirate stations. They played predominantly, all the DJs played predominantly jungle, and I bust with that sound. And then I didn't get booked on the first Jungle Fever, but they booked me on the second one because the people are asking, where's Navi? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um... And then it lasted out. I met up with them people that did the um, London Something this documentary and, you know, the rest is history. But the first people to book me was Roast. The event was called the Sunday Roast? Yeah, it used to be on a Sunday. Sunday and, night? Yeah, Sunday night, yeah. Oh, it wow. actually used to start at 1 o'clock in the afternoon until about nine ten on a Sunday in a, in a venue called Turnmills. And then they moved from there to... Linford Studios and that used to go from about 8 o'clock until 1 in the morning I can't even imagine that, so you'd have a race starting in Sunday afternoon running through till Sunday night you don't get that kind of stuff anymore though, do you? No, you don't get that no more wow. the days was nice man, like we used to rave the whole week, seriously there was something going on every single night, but in most cases it would be a Thursday, Friday, Saturday Sunday thing, you know back then, like, them times that we used to go Paradise Club Islington, hey, well, sick dances, man. We used, to, we used to come back from somewhere, wherever, abroad, go home, go sleep, 
wake up seven o'clock in the morning and drive to paradise to catch that eight to ten set Kenny and Randall back to back. Jeez, mad. Eight a.m. till ten a.m. Right? Yeah, because I was never used to done till one in the afternoon. God. And then you'd leave straight from there and go to um, afternoon club or something like that. I can't remember breakfast club or something. You know, you just wait for the DJs to turn up. There'd be people in there before the DJs even turn up. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, man. And then we'd just be in there for a while or so, and then we'd go to we'd go to um, Sunday Roast because Sunday Roast had, you know, like the DJ Rons, Jumper Jack Frost, Ryder, Young It, Tansing, yes. you know, original them them Monday, the original Connie Con, original Roast crew. So I had things like Roast on Cool FM. Where they're like really the founders of promoting the music. I mean, obviously, there was a lot of people and producers making music like that, but the people that was actually promoting it on that level was Roast and Cool FM. And I, I owe them two brand names a lot because, you know, that was where I launched my career as an MC from. Remembering that I had to change my whole style over, I had to, it was like I had to go to the bottom of the rung and rebuild really myself. Remember, I'm the biggest, I'm on the biggest sound in North East London, Unity. I'm a top boy. And then I have to come, I come into this scene mm. and nobody knows me. So I've got to start again from scratch, rebuild my name, you know? So, you know, when you talk about Roast and Cool FM, yeah. going by memory of the um, London something, this documentary, is that Kingsley and Everton and Eastman? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah. Okay, so how important are guys like... And a guy called Smurf. Smurf, yes, 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 yes. yes. Smurf and Eastman started off Cool FM. Was it around that time as well that you linked up Mampi Swift? Yeah, um, 93. I started working with Swift on the station and he was just called DJ Swift. And at that time, he had Swift and Zinc. Swift and Zinc, okay. Because DJ Zinc used to spell this guy called Swift. Okay. Yeah, so they were called Swift and Zinc. And Man P never used to like it. He was like, ah, oh, why is he calling himself Swift? I'm Swift. And then I found out that the guy's name was David Swift. So I was like, <laughs> bro, you're going to have to put something before or after your name or something to switch up your team. And he was like, nah, 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 my name is DJ Swift. And they were, one day we just, I think it was some jungle tune. It was like some Warbath size, Warbath size, Warbath size, Man P, which just means big. That's yeah. what Mampi means, and I just started calling him Mampi Swift. I just started calling him, calling him Mampi Swift, and he just stuck. He didn't like it, but now he's Mampi Swift, whether he likes it or not. Yeah, that's the name now, isn't it? Mampi Swift. Well, it's me and Mampi Swift. You just mention that to him, and he'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> cool FM, third birthday. Mampi Swift, back to back with Younghead, with Jesus Navigator, Ragga Twins. 5-0, Stevie Hyper D's on that as well. Then on the flip side, you've got Footloose and Brocky with um, Moose. Again, I think Demon's on there and you've got MC Debt. So that even to this day, I mean, bro, I'm not even lying to you. I can probably recite all of that tape because I love that tape that much here. Yeah. But that tape, the just the um the vibe that just from that recording, it sounded like, oh, you tell me, what was it like? the maddest dances I've ever been to. When we got there, the whole of Centre Point, roadblock, you know, roadblock, police out there telling people, no, you can't come in. <laughs> you couldn't even get the other side of, uh, to the other side of the police to even get anywhere near to try to walk to the door, let alone, you understand, because the whole place was just run. Roadblock, roadblock. Anyway, um, so Bushkin's dad, Bushkin's dad is a guy called Egan, and I know him from Tottenham. He's an elder, and he saw me, and um, he came off of the off of the um step and came to the police and said, "Nah, he's an artist. Let him through," and he let me through. Um, and then they they parted the crowd and I got in there. And when I got in there, dude, you never heard anything like it. You couldn't even hear the music. You could not even hear the music. It was so loud. Air noise, like whistles, horns, it's made. It, it was the most electric rave I've ever been in, man. Yeah. Madness, madness, madness. Touch the mic. 
crazy, crazy, crazy dance, crazy dance. Bro, I, I remember. Think that's when, I think that's when what's in them Radio One kind of was like, yeah, these, it's, that's what we want on Radio One now. That pirate Michael, they saw the crowd, they heard about it. Cause it's just around the corner from Radio One, isn't it? Yeah. Cause Radio I was at Oxford Circus. They must have heard about it, man. Cause it was a <laughs> complete roadblock. It was on a dance. Talks about it all the time. Doug's talks about it all the time. He said, never, I never got in the dance. Never got in the dance, man. So we got there too late. So he never got in the dance. It was too mad. You know, but he said, you know, every single word of all the cassettes. Cause, yeah, you know, man. It's, like, it's history. I'm telling you, that that tape pack there is history. I, I was lucky enough to um, speak to a guy called Phil, who used to be part of Jungle Fever. And he actually sent me one of the last copies of of the tape pack that he had so i'm actually a proud owner of the actual tape pack the six pack and okay yeah it is one of them that just for tape pack collectors out there having the cool fm third birthday bash was just like yeah that's like one of the holy grails of tape packs do you know what i mean it's just in stone you know like very legendary very very legendary man that's all i can say can you yeah. share any memories of how busy you were with booking? So you had gigs like Roast, Fever, Telepathy, yeah. Thunder and Joy, Amazon, Desert Storm, VIP Champagne Bash, yeah. Hysteria, AWOL. Like what, what kind of, how busy were you with bookings around this sort of time then? Seven, eight bookings every week for about two years straight, man. And when I did the second Jungle Fever and I came off of that stage, there was about 10 promoters there waiting. And they all took my number and I got bookings. And you have to understand there was big parties going on, but Jungle was so huge yeah. and so new that everybody was putting on parties. So there'd be midweek parties, there'd be small parties, little club parties, little private affairs. There'd be industry bash places where they'd have Jungle and Jungle bass playing. And I was around a lot of people in the industry, management, um, a lot of media people, a lot of magazines, publishers, record labels, A&Rs. You know, there was a lot of people sniffing around the music, so there was always something going on. Like, there was every day there was something going on. If you wanted to read 24-7, that was not a problem. Not a problem at that stage of the thing. So, you know, it was very, very busy for me. I was doing a lot of things, and and then I, I did a track with a contemporary jazz band called um, D-Note. And that's when I did criminal justice and iniquity work. This is like 94. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it kind of got me into recording. That was my first proper release. So I'm on this album with like some very big artists from America. And they choose my two tracks to be the singles off of the album. I was like, wow. But I knew why they did it. It's because Jungle was the thing At that time, it was the new music. And they was experimenting with Jungle Beats and Jazz. Yeah, I was emceeing over the top, and the same thing was that they heard my content, and they it was very conscious, you know. Um, I always, even when I was on sound system, I always used to chat conscious lyrics because I always saw myself as a very intelligent person, and mm -hmm. I don't want to be chatting any and anything on the mic. I grew up in a religion, you know, a God fearing. Yeah, yeah. So. It wasn't like I wasn't I wasn't into cussing on the mic or chatting slackness or none of that. Yes. I never, I've never had a weed lyric, for mm -hmm. instance. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so that's that's basically what they what stood that you know I was chatting these conscious lyrics and at that time the criminal justice bill had just come in and they wanted to make a statement about it so we wrote this criminal justice song justice justice criminal justice this justice it's criminal. You know, I started talking about, you know, the injustices in the system. So what was the criminal justice bill? What was that? They were cautioning you, saying that anything you say now could be used against you in a court of law later on. You could get, you could, you could, you could talk yourself into a hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? They, yeah. could, they could make up anything they wanted to say and then use it against you later on. Um, you know, it was kind of a new law. It, it'd never been like that before. Do you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Could stop and search you on suspicion and all of these things. It was crazy. So around that time, who would you play out with in terms of DJs and MCs? And like, who were your travel companions? Like, did you, were you regularly booked with a DJ or a MC? Is that how it used to work? Or was it just you were just on a flyer or on a bill and whoever would be on your set time, that's who you'd be playing with? Yeah, I kind of came up in it with Moose. Um, because I used to do 
the roast party. So I used to be resident on roast. So Moose was the one that kind of schooled me and showed me how to properly MC over jungle. You know, leave the vocals alone, Navi. Refrain from talking over the mix. Just, you know, little things and, you know, add to it. But don't crowd it out and wait for your spot. Wait for the rhythm to come and then when it comes, you jump in. It don't even matter. As long as you've got your bars right, you're good. You know what I'm saying? Even if you're coming two bars late, it doesn't matter. Just make sure you're on point and make sure you're not chatting over vocals and the mix too much. So once I learned that, it kind of taught me how to properly MC over jungle. You know, but I used to do... But when I when I kind of chat with Raga Twins, they're not really hosts. They're more spitters, you know what I'm saying? So yes. we kind of go... We, we get more lyrical. I get more lyrical when I chat with, with Demon and Flinty, you know, and they like to work with DJs that just play rhythms. Do you know what I'm saying? As opposed to DJs who play a lot of vocals. Whereas with me, I don't mind. You know, I go out with Remark and, you know, he's playing all dub plates and their vocals. Same thing with Aries or any of these guys that play that they're lined up. Same thing again. I can host over that because I know how to drop that. Mm -hmm. I can host like I'm on a sound system. I know most of the artists. So I'm saying, oh, so I like Johnny Osborne or whatever. And this, that. And, you know, you just... You kind of know how to juggle it, you know what I'm saying? And then you still, they still play rhythms. So, you know, you just wait until your team comes, you know, and it's going <laughs> to drop and then you just jump in and do your thing, you know? So, yeah, it, the whole MCing thing for me, kind of, I do a lot of different styles of MC. I can MC pretty much over anything, especially when it comes to hosting. So, yeah. you know, but I never really used to work with anybody in particular. I used to want to work with Swift, but he, he never used to get booked on the main stage. So I used to be working with people like... Groove Rider, Mickey Finn, DJ Run, a lot of the time maybe Brocky as well, we used to MC with Brocky and Det sometimes, but me and D-Man would most probably get, you know, put on a lot of sets together, um, Kenny Ken, Jumping Jack Frost, Fabio was kind of off in his, on his own tangent from early, sometimes you get to chat with people like DJ Rap, or TJ Bookham even, yeah, back in the day everybody used to be on the same bill. But I really wanted to chat with Swift, but he just never was, he wasn't getting the, the respect and, and the boost. He was getting sick in arena all the time. Cool FM hit squad. And I was um, on the main arena because, you know, I was one of the bigger MCs. So I never really had, you know, Darren J as well, I used to play a lot with. Yes. But, you know, even high. So who were your favourite, you know, in those days with regards to the art of DJing? Because for me, Darren J is one of these, like, underrated unsung heroes because his mixing style is fantastic so yeah he's good he's a good dj who who was like the djs that you used to really be like used to really that like, sort of fire you up on the mic rider man rider yeah yeah rider was a done them times yeah. rider was a king okay yeah rider was a gun i used to like run as well run was big yeah run and rider and swift for me were the three biggest you know what I mean? Yeah. But I used to rate everybody still because, you know, I was good friends with Frost. We used to go and check him. Randall was another DJ that I used to love as well because Randall, I watched Randall come up from the underground record shop in Forest Gate. Yeah. Him and Uncle 22, Cool and Flex. Fats used to come down there. I remember when Fats used to be begging hype to do a tune and it, like, back in the early 90s, you know, before Fats bus on the jungle, you know. I was there when they was all there, but... Randall, boy, he'd be in a record shop playing tune, you know, and we just give him a cassette and he would just take, he'd just be playing music in there and selling music and he'd be take the whole thing and then just give us a cassette. I've still got some of them cassettes. Wow. One away Randall cassettes and he'd just mix in, a, mix in a record shop and give it to us and then I see him kind of take it from that level, send it force radio and then the next thing he got booked on AWOL and then that's when his career started to properly take off. One thing about Randall is that pitch that he used to get on the vinyl you know sometimes when you're listening you can hear the dj sort of chasing the beat he's speeding it up or he's slowing it down with a randall tape that's the one thing you'd never get his mix seamless, and his man. yeah seamless mixing i just did a set with him in croatia a few weeks ago hospitality on the beach and he played a five hour set mate it was so good so good really really good didn't even leave i was there the whole time he didn't leave my he didn't even go to the toilet. Wow. He was just there, bro, just busting out tunes. But yeah, he's, he's still got it, man. He's, you know, same way. Same yeah. way, same way, man. Yeah, but like, you know, we used to play with a lot of different, different DJs them times. Yeah. It was good, you know what I mean? At that time, Shy just come up as well. He started to come up. You know, yeah. Because he did the, he did the, um, the gangster tune with Gunshot first, and then he did UK Apache, 
original nutter and then that was it shy was up there doing his thing as well the whole sour thing sound of the underground records yeah sound man elizabeth troy all of them people there do you know what i mean 